Steve Chobo, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer, joined me a little earlier. Steve Chobo, thanks very much for joining me. Pleasure, Helen. Now, it was a, it's been a big few days for the government. Let's talk the FTA with China first. An historic agreement. Sure. In your view, is Australia getting a better deal out of this access than China? Or might there still be a kicker in the tail? More Chinese investment in Australia that will worry Australians and greater access for Chinese workers to Australian jobs? Well, I think they're two separate things. Uh, one is whether or not, as a nation, our national interest has been served here. Uh, and I can unequivocally say that, yes, it has. I mean, we're going to have more access to China than we've ever had. In fact, uh, this is the best free trade agreement that any other country has been able to achieve with China. In fact, the only two uh, who arguably have better access to the Chinese market is Hong Kong and Macau, and they're effectively uh, you know, Chinese territories. So this is a great outcome for Australia, and in particular, Helen, in relation to services. A lot of people forget that services is about 70% of the Australian economy, and we've really ramped up access by Australian service providers into China. Now, the second thing you asked about, about you know, what's the Australia, what, what is likely to be Australia's feelings about inbound Chinese investment, you know, I'm acutely aware that there's sensitivity around that. I understand a lot of Australians are concerned about inbound investment. But the fact is, as a nation, we've been importing capital into Australia ever since we were settled. So, yes, we'll continue to do that. But ultimately, that inbound investment is good for Australia. We're a richer nation than we've ever been. Uh, and in large part, it's exactly because of that inbound capital investment. What about allowing Chinese workers in to potentially take Australian jobs? Well, I don't think that's a fair sum uh, summation. Uh, the fact is that they'll only be allowed to come in when there aren't adequate skills in Australia uh, and on projects of more than 150 million. So it's going to be uh, quite narrowly confined and there are uh, tests in place about whether or not workers are allowed in. But uh, the flip side of that coin though too, Helen, is it's also going to allow Australian executives and um, certain Australian workers to go into China. Uh, we know that there's huge demand in China for Australian talent, Aust Australian skills. So like all these things, there's swings and roundabouts, um, but ultimately we've maintained the safeguards in place. Uh, no Australian's going to lose their job as a consequence of this. In fact, many more Australians are going to be able to secure jobs as a consequence of this agreement. Well, Radio's Alan Jones absolutely hammered the Prime Minister this morning about this free trade agreement sure. not benefiting Australians and he asked can Australians or can the Prime Minister buy a farm or a factory in China and Jones told the PM the answer is no and that worries a lot of people. Was he wrong? Well, if you're an Australian services business, just say, for example, Helen, uh, you're an aged care business or you're a, uh, you know, an education uh, business or you're a legal services business, uh, all these businesses can now go into China and set up shop. Now we know, for example, in China and India, there's about 600 million people that are effectively uh, considered to be middle class. Now this now means that Australian services exports businesses can go into these countries, and in this particular case into China, and set up a model that supplies aged care services or education services or legal services or construction services, all these types of things, in China, a market of 1.3 billion people. So, you know, look, uh, this is good news. This is fundamentally really good news for Australia. Food security is obviously a huge concern for China. Do you think this is either at the heart of or partly explains why they appear to have given us pretty good access to their markets with most tariffs gone within a dozen years? Well, I think that food security is part of it, but I, I also think that China ultimately recognises uh, that they want to have a win-win uh, outcome here. Uh, the President went to great lengths today in our nation's parliament to talk about how China's view of the world is that the best outcome of all is when it's a win-win outcome. Uh, now, we know that we produce some of the cleanest, greenest food in the world, uh, so why not? make the most of our ability to export that into a very large market like China. Um, why not take the opportunity to export brilliant Australian skills through our services business? Uh, why not take the opportunity to have access to a market of 1.3 billion people? Uh, this really is a great opportunity for Australia and I recognise some of the concerns that Alan Jones has. I understand that uh, So you don't think we're giving up too much in return? 
I absolutely do not, no. I think that Australia has got a very good outcome here. Uh, the fact is that we are allowing our exporters, be they services exporters or manufacturing exporters or agriculture or mining, to have access to uh, arguably the biggest market on the planet. And I think that's a great outcome for our businesses. Who are the losers out of this FTA? Is it, for instance, even more the nail in the coffin for less advanced manufacturing in this country? That, you know, we could be flooded with cheaper imports and we lose jobs in manufacturing and in some other sectors. Well, you know, Helen, we've seen, for example, the textiles, clothing and footwear industries, they've been doing it tough for some time. I'm not going to pretend that they haven't. Um, the simple fact is that countries have different competitive advantages. Uh, if you were in a business in Australia where you basically had a high labour force cost and you were competing against a low labour force cost business out of China, you're going to continue to be under pressure. But the flip side of that coin is that in Australian businesses, be they manufacturers or be they services, uh, where you have specialist skill sets, where you've got the ability for Australians to provide world-class uh, expertise in a range of areas, we're now going to be tapping into one of the biggest markets in the world. Um, and I think that's a really good outcome because Australia have brilliant innovators. Some of the best inventions in the world come from Australia and now we're going to have the opportunity to be able to export those into other nations and to sell them into, as I said, one of the biggest nations in the world. Well, MP Bob Catter, who represents a big area of primary producing parts of Australia, he's called it more billows of bulldust from Canberra. He reckons the vast bulk of the food exports into China will be produced, quote, on Australian land owned by Chinese, produced by the Chinese and manned by Section 457 Chinese workers. Now, is he overblowing this or is he right? Well, you know, typical for Bob Catter, it is complete and utter rubbish. Uh, Bob Catter, you know, does his electorate a great injustice, a, a tremendously great injustice, because he goes around whipping up fear that simply is not anchored in fact. The notion that the majority of Australian land, or anything even close to the majority of Australian land, and I'm talking here about agricultural land or farming land or mining land, the notion that that's even remotely close to being owned by the Chinese is complete and utter rubbish. And let's not lose sight of the fact, Helen, that where you do occasionally, from time to time, get an Australian farmer who chooses to sell out and say, well, I want to sell my business and I've got a potential Chinese purchaser here. If we adopted the kind of policies that Bob Catt is talking about, then we as a government would be saying to an Australian, we don't care how much you can get for the sale of your property off a Chinese buyer, you're not allowed to sell it to them for the highest price because we're going to limit you to only selling to an Australian who's not prepared to pay as much. OK, so you've poo-pooed what Bob Catt has had to say, but I do want to ask you, do you interpret the very warm speech by President Xi this afternoon as well as, the tra as well as the trade deal, really as a way to try and draw Australia very much closer in towards China, as Professor Hugh White sees it, and perhaps even draw us away a little from our close ties with the United States. Well, I think the Prime Minister best encapsulated this when he said, uh, you don't make new friends at the expense of old friends. Uh, the simple fact here, Helen, is that we've secured a great deal under this FTA for Australia. And we have done this even though we've taken some tough decisions in the last little while in relation to, for example, whether or not we got involved in the, Austra in the Asian uh, Infrastructure and Investment Bank, um, even though we strongly support the American position in relation to the US pivot into well, the Asian Well, you did exactly region. what the Americans um, asked of you on that, perhaps to our that's detriment. Precisely no, but this is my point. Is that what I'm saying is that we've still secured a very good deal for Australia, uh, a deal that serves our national interest very strongly, even though we've stood steadfast beside the Americans on some other issues. So that's precisely my point. I mean, this is, this is where the depth of the relationship and the strength of the relationship between Australia and the United States, as well as Australia and China, really is at one of the strongest positions it's ever been. All right. Well, would you agree, though, at the G20, I mean, how miffed was your government about President Barack Obama firstly stealing your thunder and sealing the climate deal with China just days before the Brisbane summit and then making an impassioned speech urging young Australians to get their government to make a stand on climate change? Well, the good news, Helen, is that we already are making a stand on climate change. No, how miffed I mean, the deal for you was, was my question. Well, I wasn't particularly miffed because uh, President Obama 
and the Chinese announcement was talking about something that's going to happen from the year 2030 onwards. Um, anybody who takes the time to look at the facts around this issue knows that we're already acting as a government. And by the way, this is a bipartisan position with the Labor Party. Uh, we are reducing our CO2 emissions uh, by 5% on the year 2000 levels by 2020. But Steve Cherbo, your government did want to try and keep climate change as an issue off the G20 agenda. You didn't want, um, as we understand it, to put the, the Green Climate Fund into the communique. In a sense, climate change overshadowed what your government would like to say was a very successful G20 on jobs and growth. Well, with the greatest respect, I simply don't agree with your assertion. Uh, I think that this was a very good G20. Uh, we got a great outcome on jobs and growth. We got a great outcome on having the global infrastructure hub based in Sydney. Uh, a great outcome in terms of driving uh, infrastructure investment. Um, the fact that it talks about climate change is, is, not, is not of concern to the government. I, I think that's a good thing. I embrace the fact that it talks about climate change. In fact, what it says, as it appropriately ought to say, is that governments around the world should look at uh, the Paris conference next year as being being the stage upon which further climate change commitments can be made. So, you know, I know elements of the media have sort of hyperventilated about climate change being mentioned, uh, but from a government perspective, we were never opposed to climate change being mentioned. Our point always, though, was that we wanted the focus to be on the terrific outcomes we secured in terms of jobs and economic growth. Well, I mean, you say you, um, that was your position, but do you also embrace the fact that several of the world leaders who came here on the weekend actually sort of was urging Australia to do more on climate change? But we're already doing more, Helen. This is my point. I but mean, why did the leaders the need to point to Australia more. as having to do more? David Cameron, well, you need to the ask, German Chancellor? You need to ask them. I'm asking sure, you. Sure, you need to ask them that question. Well, I'm telling you the answer. And the answer is that we are providing a cut of 5% on year 2000 levels by the year 2020. And that is equal to anything that the United States has announced in relation to climate change. But here's an important difference. Barack Obama, as President of the United States, made this announcement. But he's actually got zero ability to actually drive the reform required through his Congress. That stands in stark contrast to our actual action here in Australia, where we are reducing CO2 emissions. And in fact, we've reduced CO2 emissions in Australia by more than the United States has. And we will continue to reduce them by more than the United States is committed to. But we've actually done it through law in the parliament whereas President Obama can't even get it through his Congress. So I think it's important to split and to cleave off the rhetoric from the actual action. And what we as a government are about is taking action, whereas what we've been hearing a lot about is simply rhetoric. All right, Steve Chobo, appreciate your time tonight. Thanks for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thank you.